All right, so let's maybe get started with uh, a couple introductions. Uh, I'll be moderating the panel. My name is David Frochier. Uh, I run a company called Decusis Capital. We are building a, an institutional grade fund to fund strategy uh, in crypto. Uh, what that basically means is it's our job to identify and invest in the top crypto funds in the world. Um, yeah, that's me. Let's hear from the panel. Maybe Charlie, can you kick us off with a bit of background and, and what you're doing right now? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Charlie Noyes. Um, I am a principal at Pantera Capital, um, asset manager for the cryptocurrency space, uh, one of the largest uh, hedge and venture funds. Um, my background is I got into Bitcoin late 2011, early 2012, mining it, um, and actually using it as a currency. Um, I got banned from PayPal. So. Um, but uh, so I stayed into it, um, got really into the technology behind it, um, started working on research around um, new Byzantine fault tolerant mechanisms, things that you could do with crypto like secure multi-party computation, um, and ended up dropping out of high school to go to MIT to work on this stuff. And while I was there, one of my friends, uh, Joey Krug, who started Augur, um, left to join Pantera Capital as our CIO, and I decided to drop out and leave to go join with him. So for the last year and a half, two years, I've been investing in the space. Uh, Melton Daenerys, I'm Chief Strategy Officer at CoinShares. CoinShares is a digital asset manager. We offer institutional products to both retail and high net worth investors, including ETNs, as well as private strategies. And recently, um, when I joined in May, we started focusing on a new institutional service that to institutionalize the crypto asset space by offering treasury management services to ICOs and crypto projects. I also have my own venture fund called Athena Capital. And prior to that, I worked with Travis for three years at Digital Currency Group and was part of the founding team there. Thank you. Um, so my name is Travis Sher. As Melton mentioned, I work at Digital Currency Group. I'm on the investments team there. And what we do is we, we build companies, we buy companies, we make venture capital investments, and we invest directly in cryptocurrencies, all in the broadly defined blockchain digital currency space. Um, so we own a few companies. We own Coindesk, the biggest media company in the space. We own an asset management business called Grayscale and a trading desk call, called Genesis. Um, so I work on our venture capital investing and our, our new cryptocurrency investing. Hi, uh, I've been on and off stage a few times today, but um, my name is Richard Muirhead, so I'm part of the founding team at Fabric Ventures. Um, and we are kind of taking the venture capital model and making whatever adaptations that seem to be necessary for this um, brave new world. Uh, we think there, um, there are many points that are just the same. I think, uh, you know, uh, being friendly to the founding team and thinking about the community and being patient and uh, actually being pretty technical is pretty important. But there are some changes as well, of course, coping with the nature of custody of tokens and the security questions and participation in, the, in, uh, in these decentralized networks. Um, my background is I've uh, built a few software companies uh, over the years. The first one I built with my brother, who's Charlie, who runs this show. Um, and, um, and then I was uh, set up a seed uh, fund called Firestarter and for three years was general partner with Open Ocean. Uh, one of, where one of my partners uh, was the author of MySQL, a fairly popular open source database. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I get to spend a fair chunk of time talking with fund managers, uh, and one of my favorite things to, to get people started is, is to try and get them to, to zoom out as much as possible and try and identify kind of, uh, if possible, kind of one core idea that got them excited about crypto in the first place and, and push them to make the plunge and not just work full time in the space, but start with you guys investing other people's money into it. Um, and so I'm, I'm really curious from each of you if there was this kind of light bulb moment um, that you had, or one kind of core idea that you've wrapped your whole thesis on the space around. Uh, Richard, I know you've been kind of vocal about like this concept of the sovereign individual. Um, and so maybe you could start us off and, and speak a little to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I had uh, uh, come out of my second company in 2009 and um, was exploring uh, moving into this uh, the realm of investing. And um, I, I guess definitely at that point in time, I, I hadn't come across a, a wave, a movement, a, a change into the infrastructure that had really got me super excited uh, until um, 
sort of 2013 or where I'd heard of Bitcoin before. I'd come across it even as early as 2009, but let's be clear, I had not piled in in any way, shape or form, but I was introduced or reintroduced to it by um, uh, Steve Waterhouse, who was just setting up Pantera at the time uh, in the spring. And it kind of um, uh, matched with some of my ex experiences in building uh, my second software company, where we'd try to get people to um, uh, apply their knowledge and capture their knowledge to solving really complex uh, problems. Um, and um, doing that is, is remarkably hard. Um, and, and so getting them to capture their data, to share it willingly, uh, providing that incentive to them uh, was quite a struggle. So when I came across projects like um, actually what was called One Name at the time in, in 2000, 2013 that became Blockstack and saw how you could start to create this uh, self-sovereign identity. Um, and I also uh, was involved in a, uh, an instance where uh, without any in intermediaries being involved, someone moved $100 million, kind of just like that. Um, I, um, within 2013, kind of the light bulb went off that, that this technology that uh, was highly accessible but perceived by many people as being fundamentally broken or trivial uh, actually had huge potential. So that was kind of my light bulb moment okay. sometime in 2013. And Travis? Um, so I discovered Bitcoin in 2014, and my background was in law and in finance. So I knew very, very little about technology at that point. Um, and and uh, so what, what resonated with me most deeply about it was the analogy to gold. Um, so like most people, I had never thought very deeply about what money is fundamentally and what gives it value. Uh, it turns out that what gives gold value is certain fundamental characteristics that make it good money. There's nothing intrinsic about gold uh, in and of itself that, that makes it valuable. It's these characteristics. And um, in 2014, I was practicing as a lawyer trying to find something more fun and interesting to do with my life. So I started learning about these different areas of technology and um, read about how Bitcoin has all the characteristics of gold, but, um, but better. And at the time, the total market capitalization was, was around, I think, three or four billion dollars. And, and I just thought that that um, did not reflect how profound uh, a concept Bitcoin was. And so that was, that was kind of my intro. That was what got me excited. Obviously, since then, I've, I've learned about the, a lot of the broader ideas and, and the broader applicability, but it was that basic digital gold concept that got me excited. So I guess Bitcoin origin stories, this is kind of a rite, a rite of passage for everyone in the cryptocurrency space. Um, in 2012, I started reading about Bitcoin. Really, I just found it extremely entertaining, um, the crypto anarchist aspect of Bitcoin especially in 2012 when I started getting excited about it, it was really interesting. I went on localbitcoins.com. I met someone in a grocery store parking lot. It felt like a drug deal, but I was buying Bitcoin. So I was like, this is, this is amazing. Um, I spent two years in graduate school at MIT from 2013 to 2015. There were students setting up Bitcoin faucets, so you could literally just go to a website and get Bitcoin. It was a great time to be a Bitcoiner. There were students mining in their dorm rooms, setting their dorm rooms on fire. <laughs> so it's just a really fascinating time to, to be there and to be on that campus. And one of, one of the things that really drew me to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, when I first started out, um, when I joined DCG in 2015, we weren't really even a company yet. And going around and going to Wall Street, to all of the major financial institutions, I raised money from MasterCard and Western Union and CIBC and Foxconn, some of the largest institutions in the world. And when you would go and talk to them about Bitcoin, they'd say, mm, yeah, this Bitcoin thing, like whatever, that's over here, but blockchain, that's awesome. And so to me, it's really this idea of a Trojan horse that started more on the enterprise SaaS side. But the more that people started learning about blockchain technology, the more that people realized the value was really in this idea of creating protocols. And in this case, unlike the internet boom in the 99-2000 timeframe, people could actually invest in protocols via these things called tokens. 
And so to me, you know, we understand equity financing, we understand debt financing. I come from the world of corporate finance and trading. I've known that most of my career, but this idea of token financing and where that fits in is really new and really unique. And so I couldn't think of a better place to spend my time than working on the next five to 10 years of really sorting out what the implications would be, not just for the crypto ecosystem, which has grown exponentially in the last five years, but for the broader world of macro and finance and what's happening from an economic and political perspective. Cool. Um, so this is going to sound kind of boring, but uh, I think generally when I think about um, from like the 10,000 foot view of why this stuff is interesting, um, if you think back through the history of financial markets, uh, the underlying products themselves haven't changed very much, but the ways in which they're able to be transacted, held, whatever, has, ch has changed drastically. Um, so I mean, just electronic trading versus single entry accounting ledger books, pretty drastic change over time. Um, however, the actual underlying instruments are extremely similar. We haven't really created anything that uh, is radically different from what you might have imagined being created even in the days of like single entry ledger accounting. Um, I think the most interesting thing in our core thesis is that this stuff allows you to create similarly incentivized instruments um, and fundamentally equity and debt instruments are, are <coughs> incentive systems built around um, you know, notions of specific types of products um, in ways that are more interesting. So this, mean, this can mean that um, you have, for example, um, a stable coin generated by a shared pool of debt in which uh, you can structure a product where um, if I contribute to this multi-asset pool of debt um, that represents the value of the stable coin, uh, if I contribute assets which fail more than the average, then the amount of tokens that I hold can inflate separately from other people. It's basically like you take computer science and apply it to financial instruments and all of a sudden you can create things that still retain their incentive correctness in a way that um, I think requires decentralization, but uh, are significantly more complex and more individualized than just like some general instrument that doesn't really have any interactive properties to it. Um, and when you get to that point, it might sound boring, but you can start creating things that are uh, the kind of um, results of which or products of which are really, really interesting um, and largely applicable and allow you to create things that I think could not exist in any other, um, in any other way. So. Cool, that's super interesting, thank you. Um, so one of the big questions that I get again and again from institutionals is, if this stuff is open source, then how much value can actually accrue to the protocol and the token itself? And kind of crucially, how defensible is that value? And I get a little bit uncomfortable talking to investors about this uh, who are from the traditional kind of equity world because I think they are used to a much more kind of nuanced and granular discussion and understanding of moats uh, in equities. And I think that as a community in crypto, We've spoken kind of very lightly of like concepts around network effects and, and utility versus store value, but I think there's still kind of a lot of, a lot of thinking and, and work uh, that needs to happen in this space. And so I just wanted to ask each of you kind of with kind of examples and being as specific as you can get, like maybe from your own portfolios, um, like exactly how do you build defensible and persistently <coughs> defensible protocols? Like, have you guys seen any particular interesting mechanisms around this? Uh, Melton, if you want to take it. Sure. Uh, so I think Bitcoin has been the most defensible protocol I've seen so far. I think one of the most important things to keep in mind, um, when I started out, I guess I was a Bitcoin maximalist, and that almost feels like a dirty word now. But I think Bitcoin to me was the idea that really made sense. It was an analog, as Travis said, to digital gold, which I thought was really interesting. But it had a lot of these properties around being distributed in terms of the actual network implementation, the ability for people to push their own transactions to the network, creating a per permissionless open financial system was, was fascinating. But I think as more and more protocols have evolved and we now see innovation, not just at the protocol layer, but as the protocol layer matures, we see innovation at the network implementation layer with new consensus algorithms. So proof of work, obviously investing in mining has been one of those if you value props, but now with proof of stake, proof of space and time, there are new ways of achieving consensus that can enable people to invest and participate in value creation at the actual physical compute implementation layer. And then I think the application layer is where a lot of VCs were attracted first. It's probably most analogous to traditional early stage venture investing. 
And we've seen a lot of businesses at the application layer have actually been able to accrue a lot of value because they enable people um, who are not necessarily developers who aren't able to access the blockchain network directly themselves to interact with these protocols in unique and specific ways. So to me, really, the maturation has been, first, we created these assets and these protocols. Then we distributed them through this token incentivization vehicle, which I think has had limited success. I think we're starting to see the breakdown of ICO financing in the first and second quarter of 2018. It's been really challenging for people to raise money unless they have a really specific use case that they're uniquely addressing. Um, and I think once you move past the distribution phase into these tokens actually being live and being traded, the biggest challenge I see is really around the specificity of the set of applications that can be built on top of a protocol. And so what you're starting to see is kind of clustering of these different tokens and protocols around use cases like debt and lending, for example. Um, stable coins is now a really popular category. So I feel like in venture, things tend to move in cycles. So we've seen kind of the overcapitalization of the exchange space. Um, so now we have tons of companies who are addressing that vertical. We've seen the overcapitalization of the custody space. So we see these waves as people try to address unique problems in the space. And to me, really, it's about bringing new ideas to the market that address use cases that are actually tangible in the near term. A lot of these ideas, to me, feel still very esoteric. They're not necessarily applicable to 99.99% of the world population. And so to me, that actually creates a great window of opportunity for something like Bitcoin, which is very tangible, which has a lot of infrastructure around it to continue to capture market share. <clears throat> um, I'll jump in. So, A, I agree with Meltem that Bitcoin is the most defensible crypto asset out there right now. Um, I, I think that's because its value is largely derived from a social consensus that Bitcoin has value. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's not at this point from its technology. So, Litecoin was an early fork of Bitcoin's code that has shorter block times, and so you can confirm transactions on that network more quickly, but because fewer people know about it or believe in its security or its development team um, or expect it to be stable over the longer term, Bitcoin is, is much more valuable in the aggregate. And, and I don't see any reason that that won't persist. Um, B, I think that at the smart contract layer with these smart contract platforms, we're seeing an extraordinary amount of competition. So Ethereum has a massive lead today in terms of the number of developers building on it and working with it. And there are thousands of developers all over the world who are extremely loyal to Ether, Ethereum, either because they hold Ether or because they really value being members of the community on a personal level. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I expect that developers and companies will build applications on the networks that are most well suited for their use cases. And so right now Ethereum's going through massive scaling, scaling challenges. There, there are probably 20 other networks launching that have a ton of capital, incredibly capable teams, um, and, and um, yeah, they're, they're going to compete directly with Ethereum. They're going to be optimized for different use cases. They're going to make different trade-offs. And, you know, in the, in the teams I'm talking to, I'm already seeing a lot of um, companies and developers talking about building on other protocols. And so while almost everything today is on Ethereum, I think a year or two from now, it's going to be spread out. The network effects are not going to be as strong there. Um, one, one last point is... Um, we invested in a company called Hedera Hashgraph that is launching an Ethereum competitor. And one thing that's really interesting about them is that their code is not going to be open source. So what Hashgraph is, it's a new distributed ledger network um, with, a, with a new consensus algorithm. Um, it's not technically a blockchain, but it functions similarly. It has its own native cryptocurrency. Um, but uh, the Hashgraph team has patents on the consensus algorithm. And so this is, um, this is um, controversial, it's contentious in the broader community where there's a belief that, um, you know, tech, that this software needs to be open source to be successful for a variety of reasons. Um, there, um, I think the plan is to make the code open review so people can read it, but if people try and fork it and copy it, the Hashgraph team may go after them. <coughs> and so we'll see. I think some of that 
controversy might be uh, sitting on stage with us now. Do you want to? So, uh, to the ha I'll address the hash graph point first. Uh, I'll bet you on 100 to 1 odds that it doesn't work. And if it does, I promise that I'll rip them off purely to say that I rip off a patented consensus system and launch it. Absolutely commit to that. Uh, I'm okay. sure you could raise Second. the fund on that alone. <laughs> so 100 to 1 on, how would you define doesn't work? Wait, should we do this bet on Augur? Yeah. No, no, we'll no, make no. I don't think Augur's going to work. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I'll make you a scaled bet on both of those, and it, we'll figure this out after. I'm, I'm willing to bet on Go both back of those. Out of this. I'm going to hold uh, you both to it. I'm seeing my odds with Charlie. <laughs> Thank you, Melton. Appreciate it. All right. Um, okay. So, with that being said. Um, so, why, why don't you think it'll work? Longer and more technical discussion than we would want to have here, but. Um, it just probably won't. No one, no, one, no, no one has correctly figured out a way in which you can define like a formal consensus uh, protocol over uh, like a non-delineated uh, ledger. So like Hashgraph and along with a bunch of other very interesting ideas that have not yet been figured out um, don't rely on individual blocks. They use what are called DAGs, well, certain types of graphs that are computationally interesting and theoretically. Do you think DAG labs will work? DAG Doctor? labs? Yeah. You guys invested in that one, right? Mm, no, I think it has a higher probability, but I'd give it like 30%, 40%. There's still issues with transaction ordering with all of them. Okay. Let's, let's but anyway. Maybe, maybe move um, on to the next kind of controversial subject uh, um, <laughs> around stable coins, if that's right. Let's talk about stable coins. Running a little bit coins, out of time. my favorite topic. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, we didn't, David, we didn't really talk about, I mean, I would agree there are going to be more blockchains that are s specific to different use cases going to come about. But we didn't really go up the next level to talk Good. about you know, networks that might be gathering data or, or, or trying to create some kind of utility um, around their tokens, which is a bit of a controversial area because the more useful it is, it tends to have higher velocity and then people get into this whole equation of exchange debate. But just a couple of comments on that. Um, if, you take, if you think of whatever, you want to take a, a, a network for sharing your data for credit scoring, or if you want to think about a, uh, a network where you want to rely on the reputation of drivers in, in a decentralized version of Uber, um, pe the, the criticism of those, I, I, I can try to summarize, revolves around the fact that if you end up wanting to store some of your value in the, the intrinsic token to that network, um, it is quite likely that you know, one of the other tokens is a better store of value, say Bitcoin, for example, or Ethereum, whatever. So therefore, you're not going to do it. And if, um, and so therefore, either your users are going to desert you, or indeed somebody else might come and uh, clone or copy or fork your network, and then you've got competition. I do yeah. think this might so underestimate this, a couple of factors. This, uh, yeah. So people have been banging, especially in like the <laughs> like token-specific investing space. People have been banging this drum, I think, since like. October of last year-ish, that uh, most tokens, if you look at them today, um, essentially the argument behind their value is that they offer you the ability to purchase some resource in some two-sided marketplace. Um, so this could be like computational power, uh, file storage, um, the right to access, I don't know, just pick, go, go down the list on coin market cap, and like most, like 99% of them are like this. Um, so the argument against why this, or essentially why we don't believe that this is defensible, um, is that for any one of these given tokens, essentially they're saying that they would like to be uh, a currency within their own system, but floating against all others. Um, so versus something like Amazon Gold, uh, the reason that it trades at only a very, very slight discount to what you can actually purchase it for in the secondary market is that Amazon is essentially backstopping its value. It'll always be worth $1 on Amazon versus in these systems, they're two-sided marketplaces. So there's no intuitive reason with this currency being floating. There's no intuitive reason why you would not use a more liquid, uh, let's say that on Ethereum, why would you not use Ether? It's more liquid. Um, it's less likely that it's going to be susceptible to like instantaneous supply and demand shocks. Um, and 
it just doesn't really make sense to hold most of these tokens. So to answer your question about defensibility, uh, I agree with that completely. Um, I think the most defensible token models, aside from the entire store of value, what will end up being money debate, are those in which there is an actual reason for me to want to own them mechanically, meaning that um, whether I can model out the rate at which things will get bought back. So like in a system like MakerDAO, I can model out how much MKR will get bought back over time. Uh, in a system like Alger, assuming that it works, I can model out how much cash flow will be generated uh, if I am willing to act as a reporter in the system. And you can kind of go down the list and find a couple of these where there's no yet like standardized model for how this works, but I, as a rational person, uh, can reason about how much value should be contained in this token, whether it is in the form of buybacks, dividends, et cetera, um, over time, assuming different amounts of usage. In the absence of my being able to do that, you're basically making a super ephemeral, ephemeral argument about why these different two-sided marketplaces will be able to generate essentially new currencies or new stores of value. Um, and it just doesn't seem rational, it doesn't seem reasonable uh, for there to be 2,000 of these different tokens that people are holding for all of these different reasons that are all individually, you know, one two thousandth as liquid as just using ether or a stable coin or dropping something else into these marketplaces. I actually think it's much simpler than that. The way I view it is you, if, if, if you look at particular use cases, I believe in power laws. You see power laws in venture investing, you see them in biology, you see them in any natural systems. You will have one or two tokens for each specific use case or each specific vertical that accrue 80 to 90% of the value. And then there will be a long tail of others that don't make it. And one of the interesting <laughs> questions is, we've never seen a token retired or replaced. These things can continue to trade into perpetuity. So to me, the interesting question is, what happens to a token that no longer really has any activity on it? Because what you have is you have people passing the bag, so to say, onto less and less sophisticated investors. And this is, we've seen this in every sort of new market, is it's basically a shit waterfall that goes from the most knowledgeable investor <laughs> down to the least knowledgeable. And unfortunately, in the case of crypto, that often ends up being the uninformed retail investor who's trying to get exposure, particularly doing, during a boom cycle like the one we saw you know, last fall and into January of this year. But to me, it's really about looking at power laws and trying to identify those variables that will define which protocols are gonna win in each different vertical. So whether that's a developer community, whether that's about the ethos and the narrative that people create that wins hearts and minds, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows, and if they did, they should raise a massive fund, and I think that's what everyone's trying to state they're doing. But I think it's very much a question that's open for debate. But you're saying there's different classes of utility that a token might have on top of maybe a number of different blockchains, and there will be a couple of winners in each of those classes. So like in the say data marketplace category, for example. Yeah, there's a, I mean, and then the that might be applied to a number of use cases, but there'll be one token that will be sufficiently good at that and the way it's architected that it it is worth holding and be some kind of currency. I'm looking at Charlie as well. It's like a sufficiently general statement that I just can't help but agree with it, but I would say that no one, <laughs> no one, no one here uh, or anyone here who is able to uh, tell me what those are currently, like, please send me a resume, you know. That's the job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so stable coins. Um, so there's been a lot of innovation in this space, I think, in, uh, especially in terms of what I've been seeing in the last like six, eight months, um, especially around mechanism design. And it's now basically gotten to a point where it's just really unclear to me uh, what is going to win in the long term in terms of these different kind of core designs. And maybe to kick us off, uh, Charlie, you have this really interesting way of uh, when we were speaking of, of looking at, at the different token designs um, and mechanisms as being fragile or anti-fragile. And so maybe you could talk us through kind of the, the kind of two or three core mechanisms that we have. We can maybe skip the... Right, I'm going to pass, I'm gonna pass this to Melton to first describe what the, what the general kinds of stable coins are. And, sure. then, I'll tell you, I'll, and then I'll be like, yeah, okay. Just very briefly. Sure. So I view stable coins in three primary categories. There's um, asset-backed stable coins, so it's something like Tether that's collateralized one-to-one -one with US dollars, hypothetically, that are held by Bitfinex. There's something called um, Truex that's backed by gold, like ounces of gold. A lot of people are looking at potentially creating commodity coins. So the idea is you have an actual asset of some sort that's in the traditional market already considered to be the store of value, and you use that to back a digital version of it. Um, and I think that's interesting in the case where you may have restrictions on how fiat moves between markets. 
you can actually insert the stable coin into a system, um, back it with assets, and that's a great way to peg value. The second is a, the idea of a collateralized peg. Um, so this is the idea of Maker, Haven, a few other coins where you typically have a two coin system. One coin is the, um, the token that you collateralize. So in Maker, you have two tokens. One is Maker, which you can collateralize to create DAI, which is a stable coin. I, is this still pegged to the dollar? It's one to one with the dollar, yeah. but it can fluctuate. The peg can evolve over time. So today, the US dollar is the world's reserve currency. Everyone in crypto more or less benchmarks to USD, BTC, ETH, and maybe a top 10 market-weighted basket. But the idea is that you have these two tokens. As the demand for DAI or this pegged currency expands, more and more people who hold Maker will collateralize their Maker to issue DAI into the market. It'll bring the spread on the peg back down. And then they can redeem it. No, am I wrong? Uh, diff I think you might have just gotten uh did I flip with, them up backwards? Yeah, I think you flipped them. Where in, uh, in Maker, you would have like other assets, not MKR, being collateralized, right? So it would be you would use uh, a basket of say like Ether, or Bitcoin, pick a number of tokens, whatever, throw them into like a debt pool, and basically. But the Maker token gives you the right to collateralize assets to issue DAI. The Maker token is what uh, fees are paid in the system for. At, so it's super, like owning super a simply, share of PayPal. I have $200 worth of Ether, I want $100 worth of the stable coin that I know will always be worth 100 USD. In order to make that, I put $200 worth of Ether into a CDP or collateralized debt position, and that the $100 of DAI or the stable coin that I'm issued give me the right to go redeem that CDP. Uh, so let's say that its value goes from 200 to 150, I go and cash out and everything is like kosher and I can now take 150 out because I'm willing to give it back at my collateral ratio. Uh, Maker, the other token is interesting because you get basically uh, dividends, well, in the form of buybacks whenever people create these CDPs, but if the system ever becomes under collateralized, then you inflate the token to pay off whatever debt it accrues. So let's say that these debt positions fall in value fast enough that it becomes an under collateralized system, you inflate this, this speculative token to pay it off. So if you all just followed that, <laughs> you should own Maker. I own yeah. Maker and I just don't even follow it. I don't collateralize it. I don't really use it that much. Um, and then I think the third is one that I'm still trying to figure out. It's the idea of a seniorage share, but there are these really complicated three component systems where they're basically trying to create decentralized algorithmic central banks. So decentralized algorithmic central bank to me is antithetical or it's an oxymoron of sorts. Um, but the idea is, is that you could basically create a system where certain shareholders have the right to determine how seniorage rates are set and how stable coins are printed in a system. Basis is one example. There are a few others. All of that goes to say um, there are a lot of different constructions for stable coins. I'm sure that by the time this conference is done, there will be 10 new stable coins out there that we all get pitched. It'll be very interesting. Um, but if you want to talk about the value, I'm, I'm skeptical on the long-term value of stable coins. Yeah. I think they're um, short to medium-term bridge. Yeah, so um, I think we, we see more stable coins uh, than any other specific like vertical of you know types of projects people are working on. I think we've probably seen 40 or 50 of them that have raised like cumulatively call it 500, 600 million dollars over the last couple of months. So like very common, one of the most I think talked about and uh, pitched ideas in the space. Um, our general take on it is that things like makers, these collateralized stable coins, they're really just like basically derivative instruments on top of speculative cryptocurrencies, um, make a lot of sense and will probably exist uh, and last going forward and be used in like specific verticals where it makes sense to have some less speculative asset um, used that uncollateralized stable coins are interesting. I would say on par won't work. I'd give it maybe, I don't know, I'd give each of them cumulatively maybe a 5% chance of working, maybe lower. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, so, why, wait, why do you say that? Tether has well, accrued $2 billion of, of value. Sorry, that would be a, well, not just collateralized, but uh, what would you call it? Uh, Centralized, centralized peg or, you know, anyway, I'm talking about things like Basis here, um, Flamingo, Carbon, all of these cryptocurrencies were basically uh, stable coins where basically like they are supposedly going to be able to remain stable um, because any time that the value of the token falls, you're going to incentivize people to um, sell their, their coins in exchange for bonds that have some future uh, you know, rate of rate of return baked into them, and over time, as uh, if the price continues to fall, you'll sell them off cheaper and cheaper, and, and get more of the 
you know, float out of the market, so the value should go back up. The problem with this is obviously that you're always selling those bonds at a discount to like current market value, and so over time, if like the total market cap or GDP of the system doesn't monotonically increase, then like you're fucked over the long term no matter what. Um, so that doesn't seem like rational that you should be willing to bet a financial system on top of something that has a failure case that is like not that unimaginable, especially over a reasonable time scale. Um, so uh, basically the way that we look at it is these things because uh, they have to just keep, uh, keep getting larger and larger and larger in order, in order to sustain themselves monotonically over time. Uh, they're actually, the systems get more fragile as they get larger, and I would say that for most of these systems, my EV on when they'll fail is like three to four years after launch, maybe two to three. The stuff like Maker, uh, you can make a really strong argument as to why it actually gets stronger as it gets larger. You'll have more types of assets in this debt pool. You can create more uncorrelated portfolios to collateralize it with. Uh, the likelihood of an instantaneous market correction resulting in like massive under collateralization goes down, more liquidity against the things in these CDPs, et cetera. So like over time, it should actually get better, not worse. Alternatively, the other, like the larger that one of these stable coin systems, the under collateralized ones get, the more likely that I think it is that we have like a, a real issue here. Oh wait, um, what's, the, what's the argument? What I don't understand, so to me, all the things that are being done in crypto today, stable coins, institutional exchange, custody, it feels like we went from this idea from decentralized permissionless financial systems to now trying to replicate the same centralized financial infrastructure we have today. So we went from revolution creating new systems, doing things outside of the system to evolution, where everyone's now trying to cram themselves into this regulatory box or this construct. You mean why do stable so, coins exist? Or like yeah, why are they like, needed? So super like simple, super simple so example. Why? Let's say that Alger, let's say that Alger works, to your point about it, it hasn't yet launched. Uh, prediction market where shares are priced in terms of ether. So if I think this is 30% probability an event, of an event, I buy a share at 0.3 ETH, whatever, that, that represents my ownership in this market. Uh, in these types of things, uh, specifically speculative markets created on top of uh, cryptocurrencies or blockchains, uh, it doesn't make sense to price them in terms of highly volatile assets because now you're not just exposing yourself to whatever risk you're taking into account when you decide to participate in them, you're adding in sort of like market beta on top of that. So the reason why stable coins make sense to exist is that many of the products which we would want to create don't make sense to have like right. uh, you know undue exposure to, for example. But that's a short to medium so, term In a word, volatility, but also it's not necessarily regulation. It's not like you're, you're decentralizing. Yeah. Right. You're just so annualized volatility in Bitcoin's volatility. 80%. In Ether, it's 120%. In other longer tail crypto assets, it's closer to 250 to 300%. But over the long term, if we truly believe Bitcoin and some of these assets become true stores of value, then where does the value for stable coins come from? And this goes back to reference rates. Well, again, we can in, get, we in can any get type, governments in any, to create their own, you know. Yeah, Fed coin. Fed coin. So in any, in any <laughs> kind of market, <laughs> in any kind of market, it doesn't really make sense to, it basically is just a volatility issue, honestly. Specifically right now, for decentralized exchange, uh, decentralized options, and, and other types of derivative markets, and, I, well, Algor actually fits into that. So that, that's basically the vertical right now where it makes sense to have this because it doesn't make sense to price things in terms of, for example, like uh, Maker MKR against Ether. It makes sense to price it against some less volatile asset because otherwise, like, you throw off your, you know, at, take whatever, whatever uh, valuation metric you feel comfortable with and add in, you know, over time, 30% whatever monthly volatility, and you're probably not going to want to participate in that system. So, Short version. Richard, I know you guys uh, at Fabric invested in Basecoin, so what do you think of this 5% uh, Oh, well, to be mind. clear, we, we all also invested did, in but... Yeah. You all did? Yeah. I okay, we did. Yeah. It's a good EV bet. I mean, if it works, it's, it's big. Yes, yeah, so I have a venture that's Power reasonably luck. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that... Um, so, A, I think the problem it's solving is very basic. I, I have a... I mean, I have a... I have a lot of faith in Bitcoin over the longer term, but I don't know if and when we're gonna to get to a point where it's no longer highly volatile. In the meantime, people are building all these decentralized applications that rely on cryptocurrency to run, and to get ordinary users in the game, you can't expect them 
to use a volatile cryptocurrency for something like a decentralized Uber, for example. You need a- I think that's actually the most dangerous argument you could make as to why smelling basis is important. Um, so, well, it's why stable coins are important. Well, I- Specifically. Right, so the reason that I gave the example of markets, specifically those on top of Ethereum so far, decentralized exchange options, you know, derivatives, whatever, is because uh, I'm confident that Maker and these other things will work and we can push them into that vertical and not worry about risk associated with it. Mm -hmm. The thing with Basis, the reason why we invested in it, and it was uh, a good EV bet, and I still believe that it was, uh, and I like to have some chips on the table for it, but is because I believe that it'll work for a couple of years uh, and that after that it'll fail. And that for the, for the yes, purposes so of getting regular users into the game, yeah, of course, it's it's a problem for any third world country that their currency is highly volatile. That doesn't mean that pegging it is the correct answer. Uh, and the issue that I have with this argument around regular users and stable coins is that the amount of time it would take me to explain to your average user or hodler, like, like the risk factor that is associated with something like basis. Well, no uh, one thinks about risk when they buy cryptocurrencies. They just think up and to the right. <laughs> that's, that's been the predominant fair, sentiment. Fair point, which is <laughs> Which is dangerous in and of itself, yeah. scary. But, but, so, totally separate question I was answering. With your point on rebuilding the current financial system, which is what I was getting to, um, effectively, basis is not supposed to depend on the traditional financial system. That's the big idea there, right? It, if right you have, depend on basis, which is a You team depend on the al four people, algorithm. Five so, I, I agree it may not work, don't get me wrong. I, um, I don't know what the probability is that it'll fail. I don't know what my, you know, how long it'll it'll last. But there, um, the I, I do think it is the, the end goal is true decentralization. What does but what does that mean? So in my understanding of so it means, you're going to have people who get to vote on seniorage, right? How much money gets printed into the system? No, so it's That's and it's over not, time that basically it's it's actually a pretty simple algorithm. So but it's those are the shareholders in the system. It's, it's basically, right now, there's a uh, basis that stable coins worth one USD. Um, it goes to a, you know $1.10, so we're like, okay, we're gonna inflate the supply, whatever percent, and pay it off to the people that hold the speculative part of the system. It, again, it is like the a three-part system. Not the, the shareholders, not the bondholders, uh, which in this case would be us, um, having invested in it. Um, and so you're gonna get that dividend, theoretically being a smart market actor, you're gonna go sell it off while it's overvalued relative to you know a dollar USD, and then you're gonna suppress the price back down to where it should be. That's fine, I mean, that intuitively works. Any time in which you have something that you wanna decrease the value of, inflate it. Uh, the problem is, how do you bring the system back to par when it goes to less than a dollar? Uh, the answer would be that you sell off bonds uh, at a rate that, given whatever currently depressed market price there is, should have you know positive uh, EV on them and hope that people buy them, uh, and that when they do that, that they take enough float out of the market that uh, you know supply and demand. Right. So the people who make money are the shareholders and the bondholders, yep. who are people like us who already have access to a lot of information. So I think, again, like these systems, sure, they sound good at the outset, but I don't think they necessarily achieve this goal of decentralization, which I think is a fairly like esoteric word anyways, because it means a lot of different things to different people. Is it better to have um, the Fed in charge of determining the money supply or the basis team? I don't know. So, a, well, it um, is an one. interesting <laughs> idea in so far as that there is a good argument as to why, uh, I'm trying to remember who the quote was, but inflation is the product of financial systems, monetary systems, hyperinflation is the product of political systems. I don't know, it's a cool experiment, right? That's why, that's why All I'm investing in It's a super yeah. cool experiment, um, but. Yeah, just, um, yeah, so, um, so there, so basis, you're right, decentralization can mean a lot of different things. It may lead to a centralization of wealth in the basis ecosystem, but the big idea behind it is that anybody can acquire it, anybody can send it, and it's not gonna depend on a bank telling you whether or not you can use your money. Um, so some of these fully collateralized stable coins, on the other hand, where people are parking money in banks really depend on the traditional financial system. And I think those which tons of people are launching will not scale that well. 
I think it depends um, on what ecosystem people want to operate in. But I think that's the cool part is I do think we're seeing a bifurcation in the crypto ecosystem where it seems like there are a number of projects who are very much going the regulated route where they're really trying to integrate into the existing mm -hmm. financial system. And then there are a number of projects, DEX, stable coins, things of that nature that are really trying to operate in a new sort of more revolutionary way. So I think this idea of evolution versus revolution is one that I've really been gravitating towards because I think certainly from my perspective as an investor, yeah. I've certainly been seeing that more and more where there's totally. two sort of extremes of the spectrum forming. And, and what's interesting is, is a lot of the benefits of the technology are lost once you start operating in a compliant, regulated fashion. I know. Except for the speculative but aspect, which arguably is the best use case of cryptocurrencies today. Just in trust of time, because we're, we're running out. Richard, I know you wanted to speak, and then we'll move on to the next one. No, I was just going to reintroduce the question about governments issuing their own coins. Like that's the other approach to, to getting there, where it's I guess collateralized against, you know, military force and taxation and the rest of it. Or you could do yeah. a Petra yeah. like Venezuela yeah. did, yeah. 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 for example. <laughs> but that's the other way of converging on it. But I mean, I think I think the, the salient point is the question of experimentation. I mean, uh, yeah, we'd all like to know which one is going to win. But as long as we've got a lot of people trying different things, I, I, we will have some If, let's just say that right now the Fed were to issue like an ERC-20 token where I can, you know, wire them an unlimited amount of money and get tokens as a result of it, I wouldn't really care. I mean, I don't think it would be a negative thing for them to do that. Uh, I also would trust DAI as much as I trust that and be more confident that I'm not just going to get my tokens frozen. Uh, so I wouldn't personally use it, but its existence, I mean, whatever. Maybe someone will use it. Maybe it'll be interesting. So Some frozen, people will trust it. Frozen tokens yeah. kind of uh, gives us a very nice segue. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about something that's a bit more off the beaten track. Um, there's been quite a few kind of smart people uh, spending a lot of time on this. Um, it's the issue of programmatic compliance, the basic kind of thing being if tokens are just software, then you can actually bake compliance into the token itself such that it cannot be sent from a wallet or to another wallet uh, that does not comply. Um, kind of projects working on this. Uh, there's Polymath, Harbor, uh, the Zeppelin's TPL paper. Um, Meltem, I know you have some like really strong ethical views around this. <laughs> so um, you could speak to that. Sure, I, I don't think they're ethical views. I think it's just, it depends on, I guess, your ideology and what excites you about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. To me, again, the idea of forcing regulation um, into tokens inherently can make tokens fungible or non-fungible, which defeats the whole purpose of, to me, why Bitcoin was exciting to begin with. Um, and so to me, the idea of ERC-721 tokens or tokens that can have this compliance embedded in them, where you can have white lists of people who are allowed to transact with a token and a group of people who aren't, starts to really just get away from the idea of why cryptocurrencies are important to me in the first place. The other thing I really, really worry about um, this is uh, when we were on our phone call, I mentioned, you know, sometimes I wake up at three in the morning, I'm like, shit, by introducing governments, the idea of Bitcoin, did we actually introduce the most perfect tool for totalitarian control of money, identity, and the flow of information? If you think about how transparent the Bitcoin blockchain is, um, you know, having looked at some of the network monitoring tools that are out there, like elliptic and chain analysis, I think one of the big concerns is that we may have actually introduced governments to these lossless systems where everything is perfectly monitorable, which I think introduces a big ethical sort of aspect to how we design these protocols and how they get implemented. Because I think in our minds, especially um, you know, as engineers and mathematicians, at first blush, these projects look fantastic. But if you think about second and third order magnitude consequences implementing these, these protocols and these networks, you could actually start to see them used in ways that inhibit freedom ways that inhibit personal privacy and all of the other values that I think most people who care about cryptocurrencies are really passionate about. So I think about that a lot. Cool. Scary. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, in speaking to a number of, uh, should we say, government institutions across Europe about the potential for investing in this space, and of, you know, <laughs> one of their um, uh, primary ner you know, areas of nervousness is about, you know, do I have transparency? Are people going to pay tax? Are these things going to be regulated and compliant? It's a fast-moving space. It's quite hard for folks to get their head around. Um, one thing I've definitely come to believe is that actually a lot of those perceived weaknesses are going to be strengths of the space, which then presents possibly the dilemma that you're describing, which is indeed that all of this software is going to make it extremely easy to be very clear on who is transacting you know, 
with whom and on what kind of transaction and has what uh, value stored where. So, um, and that's an issue. However, I mean, I think that leads into the question about um, uh, do we need to think carefully about the architecture or to protect that privacy fundamentally in the way in which this, this evolves? And can we find a middle ground where, um, you know, these are good transactions taking place, I won't call them reg regulated, um, uh, at the same time as protecting personal privacy? To the, and paying tax. To the point we about... Uh, we need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Token registry. Okay, go ahead. Well, no one actually answered the question. <laughs> so, uh, full disclosure, short version, we invested in Harbor, but uh, I think if we're right in the long run, it won't matter. Like, it, in the long run, if all of us on stage are right about this, it's not going to matter. Um, in the short, Harbor, in, what, Harbor, maybe we should explain what Harbor does. Harbor is just a way of basically saying that for any given token, uh, let's say that I have some like uh, SPV in Sweden that has art in it, and I want to you know fracture or securitize it in the form of a token. Uh, it might not be reasonable for like uh, some certain nationalities uh, citizens to own it for whatever reason, securities laws. Just because you're like, I don't want to deal with these people in my SPV. I don't, like, for whatever reason, you can segregate token ownership to people that have certain uh, qualities. Most likely, that'll be securities laws at first. But honestly, like, uh, for a lot of this stuff, especially things that touch the real world, um, like fractionalizing, you know, ownership in in certain types of uh, things like art, whatever, uh, it it makes like a decent amount of sense. I don't think it's that much of a centralization risk. Sure, I think it's more just... If it's used appropriately. Sure, but I think the idea of um, where ethics and science intersect, right? like technology is not inherently good or bad. It's the way we use it that can make it good or bad, which is also a highly subjective thing. And I think that's where the danger comes in is, um, I think as investors, as creators, as um, entrepreneurs, we kind of have this responsibility to think about those implications. Great, thanks. And very quickly, maybe as a, as a wrap up and a few sentences from each of you, is there something that you can think of uh, that is very important? Like what is the most important thing that's happening at the moment that nobody's really talking about? Well, I mean, uh, super quick. Um, I mean, people have been talking about it a little bit, but um, the, the concept of uh, token engineering and, and very sophisticated ways of token issuance that may change over time. Um, to, to be able to um, essentially, you know, um, solve the cold start problem of very sophisticated networks. I think um, there's some work um, that Vitalik did on that uh, around being able to kind of release taps around, you know, a milestone-driven, deterministically-driven um, release of tokens when networks achieve certain milestones, for example. I think that's pretty interesting. And then the other thing I got excited by mo most recently, which I'd love to hear other people's opinion on, um, is, I mean, governance is a big problem, and how you move from, you know, uh, one person who might or might not be a nice, smart dictator um, <laughs> through to a community, you know, nurturing this, this new child. And um, therefore, you know, in just the communities around these software projects, let alone any more sophisticated decentralized organizations, um, how do we make governance work? And I, uh, the use of prediction markets to make those efficient. Uh, I thought it was an interesting idea. We have our first Agrabet on the stage. So I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred to one. Governance. Yeah. Well, the first Augur market, uh, when they launch, which will be the only one people are allowed to bet on, is will Augur fail as a prediction market? I love that. Pretty neat idea. <laughs> <laughs> Travis? Um, so I would say in my day to day, the, the one theme that is just blaring out at me is competition. So people talk a lot about price. Um, the price of these assets went through the roof last year, and that was largely driven by retail interest all over the world. Um, lagging that is a, an extraordinary amount of, of venture capital that's now moving into the space, um, institutional capital that's moving into the space, and just an incredible number of talented, experienced entrepreneurs who are starting companies in this space. Um, so what you have is, a, is, a, is an industry that has, I'd say, 10 times as much talent as it has two years ago and 100 times as much money. Um, and so, you know, from an investor's perspective, it begs the question, what are returns going to look like in a few years um, for, in terms of investing today? And, uh, you know, how, how sustainable is the lead that companies like Coinbase and Ethereum have, um, have, have achieved? But... Um, from, a, from a technology perspective, I think it's an extremely exciting time. 
Uh, for me, it's um, I'm really excited about investing in the networking layer. So much of the focus has been on protocols and applications that not a lot of people have paid attention to all of the physical compute that's going to be required to support all of these blockchain protocols, especially ones that are going to be incredibly um, intensive in terms of computational needs. And so to me, there's big opportunity both from a geopolitical perspective, an economic perspective, um, but also thinking about sustainability and the way you know people are, are thinking about powering all this compute. There is a massive opportunity there, um, just like there was in the internet. If you look at the lead that AWS has in the cloud compute space, um, it'll be really interesting to see how the blockchain compute space develops. And so um, thinking about really cool ways to finance that through new types of structures is, is exciting to me. Cool. Uh, I think an actually working proof of stake consensus system will launch in the next year. Maybe Wait, two. Not EOS. <laughs> I'm just totally joking. Mm, not even going to take the bait. Um, and um, also, zero knowledge proof systems are getting fast enough to be viable in practice now. I think those are probably the two most interesting things going on right now. Cool, guys. Uh, thank you very much. This was really fun.